Noah, thank you so much for joining us. Really grateful. Thank you for having me. I'm wondering how you can maybe draw out your map of where you got or how you got to your position in Harvard Law School. You mean uh, autobiographically, as it were? Autobiographically. There's so many different points to hit, but maybe you can tease out what you find most salient. Well, I think I was more or less raised to have that job, that I, the job that I have, which is lucky because I'm not really qualified for anything else. From the time I was a little kid, uh, my parents and especially my dad said, well, maybe you should think about going to law school and doing law. And since both of my parents were professors when I was a little kid, it was pretty clear they did not intend for me to be a, a practicing lawyer. They wanted me to be some kind of an academic. Mm. And so then it became pretty clear that they wanted me to be a law professor. And since we lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and had high holiday services in the Harvard Law School, and there would be photographs of the Harvard Law School professors hanging on the wall looking like, I thought at the time, like gods. Um, I guess it seemed natural that I would think that that was the place I would want to be a professor. And my parents were, um, they knew Alan Dershowitz very slightly, and they would sometimes, we would sometimes pass him walking on the street, and they would say, oh, that's Alan Dershowitz, you know? And I, I think, though they never said so explicitly, there was some general idea that you know, that was the kind of job I should aspire to have someday. And sure enough, now I have the same chair at Harvard Law School that Alan used to have. So I, I think sometimes I think that I was wound up like a wind up toy and I ended up doing this. But of course, that took a lot of luck along the way and a lot of help from very, very good teachers and, and mentors. Your life has come in full swing because now you're on the same podcast that Alan Dershowitz was on because he was on this podcast too. So it's like the chair at Harvard, my podcast, you know, you can, you can there, hang up the there, jersey. There, there you go. There was one time when I debated Alan um, in one of those Intelligence Squared debates. It was about drone strikes and it got a little heated. And I actually said, um, my parents told me to grow up and defend civil liberties like Alan Dershowitz, but it, I don't think it ever dawned on them that I would have to defend civil liberties from Alan Dershowitz. And I don't think Alan was very happy about that line. He won the debate measured by their their measure. He changed more people's opinions than I did. So he, I think he got pleasure out of that part of it. That's amazing. You, you did have one eccentric teacher because you brought up graciously that there were people along the way that contributed to your success. There was one teacher that you had in a summer class, I believe, and he had taught you and you kind of snuck, you kind of snuck into the my class. Yeah, that was my Arabic teacher, um, Wilson Bishai, Dr. Wilson Bishai, who was an extraordinary and influential figure in my education, who, um, uh, when I went to study Arabic with him, he called the registrar of the summer school and said, uh, I've got this kid in my office who wants to take Arabic, but he's technically too young to sign up for the courses. And he said, mm hmm, yes, mm hmm. And then he hung up the phone and he looked at me and he said, you will study Arabic. He had this beautiful mellifluous voice. You will study Arabic. And he said, there's only, there are two conditions. You may not take the final examination and you may not pay tuition for the class. And what had happened was that the registrar had told him, of course, you can't let this kid enroll in your class. And he did what all professors should do, which is he said, it's my class. I can enroll anyone I want. I just, you just won't be enrolled. So that was the perfect solution. And he became my Arabic teacher. And I also studied Arabic with him later when I was a real student enrolled at, at the university. And he was only one of, you know, amazing, amazing teachers who put a lot of time and effort into me. I had an incredible Hebrew language teacher um, who taught me for six full years uh, at, at the Maimonides School, where I went to elementary and high school. And he taught me uh, modern Hebrew to an extremely high degree of excellence and rigor just by virtue of his very, very hard work and grammatical teaching. He had enormous influence on me. My fourth grade teacher, Lois Silver, um, whom I dedicated my most recent book to, had an enormous influence on me. And then in college, I had very, very amazing and extraordinary teachers, Bernard Septimus, Isidore Torsky, Bob Nozick, um, Mohsen Mahdi, amazing, amazing people. And then in law school too, I was incredibly fortunate. And my, my most influential mentor there was Owen Fiss. So yeah, I've just been very, very lucky at every stage uh, in the mentorship that I've encountered. That's beautiful. So you've been enveloped in this academia and had all these amazing mentors along the way. You've written so many books. Who is James Madison? I know you wrote a book on him. And why are you so obsessed with this guy? Like, I see you have a little bust of him in your office. Like, uh, what's, what's well, the, going on the, with the that? bust is connected to having written the book. It's, it's less um, about James Madison and more about reminding myself that I spent six years of my life on it. Um, so James Madison was the principal draftsman of the U.S. Constitution. 
And in that role, he didn't only inaugurate American constitutionalism, but he played a central role in the inauguration of global constitutionalism, written constitutionalism. So if you're a constitutions guy, as I am, I've spent most of my adult life studying constitutions, there's no one as influential and as important as Madison. And at the same time, it's important to recall that Madison was limited by the times in which he lived and by his own choices. He was born on a plantation as the oldest son and heir. He was born into the arms of an enslaved person and an enslaved person closed his eyes when he died. And at every point in his life, Madison's livelihood was entirely dependent on labor done and performed by his slaves. And, you know, he made a few bucks occasionally in government official positions, you know, in Congress or eventually as president or secretary of state. But that was not how he supported himself or his family. And so you know, I wrote extensively about that in the long biography of Madison that I wrote. And I think it's part of my general philosophy, which is that it's really important to acknowledge the complexity in the real world, even of people whom we admire. It doesn't, in my view, mean that we can't admire them if we acknowledge and know that they were enmeshed in a society that was a slave society, that their own interests corresponded to it, that in the case of Madison, he did not free all of his slaves. Um, you know, these are things that we look on morally with appropriate condemnation. We think slavery is the most fundamental moral wrong, at least I do, and I think most people listening probably do, and rightly. And yet, we can still acknowledge that in the midst of that, Madison also did some good things. So I think that's the sort of, for me, that's the takeaway of somebody like Madison and not uniquely of, of Madison. And I would just add to that as well, you know, I was describing all the wonderful mentors I've had, but I'm really, what I'm describing is an extraordinarily life, a life of extraordinary privilege. Um, the privilege of being able to be enmeshed in universities where study was promoted and where scholarship is valued and where we try to go from that world out into the real world and do real world things that will make the world possibly better or at least um, less bad than it already is. And I'm just very, very, very lucky and privileged to have had these opportunities. And I think that privilege entails obligations as well. And in my case, I see the primary obligation is trying to tell the truth about whatever problem or issue I'm working on in a given moment. How far back do you trace the privilege? So I've lived a privileged life as well, do you see that it was your parents' work? Was it your grandparents' work? Like how in touch are you with the narrative that led up to you sitting in the literal and figurative chair at Harvard? Yeah, good question. Like a lot of Ashkenazic Jews, Eastern European Jews, my family can't really trace itself back much more than four or five generations. I think that's because in Europe, we were not people of any means, uh, significance, importance. Um, but of my grandparents, three of the four were born in the US. Of my great grandparents, all eight were born in Eastern Europe. And so, first of all, without their decisions to immigrate to the United States, which was a, you know, an act that had risk associated with it, and they all came in poverty and had to you know, find some way to make themselves able to live, um, none of this would even have been slightly possible. And simultaneously, the United States had to be at a historical moment, which fortunately it then was, where it was open to Eastern European immigration, um, including Jewish immigration. That wasn't always true in US history, neither before or, or after. So there's a lot of fortune there, but there were actual human beings, my great grandparents mostly, who had to take this tremendous uh, risk and come over to the United States. Then my grandparents' generation just worked extraordinarily hard. Um, the great grandparents too, once they came, but then my grand grandparents' generation had to work extraordinarily hard to sort of get a foothold in the American economy to the point where they could then send my parents to excellent universities um, from which they benefited from a moment in time, post-World War II United States, where it was possible for people in their position, Jews in their position, who didn't come from much money, to become part of the university and to be welcomed into the, the university at that moment of the ideology of meritocracy. And, you know, it's also true that whatever discrimination they, they, they had originally faced by the time my parents came to fancy universities, they really weren't subject to discrimination at a time when some other people would have been subject to discrimination. You know, had they, my, my father was born in Richmond, Virginia in 1940, uh, or actually, um, he, he was, was raised in, in 
not in Richmond, but in Lynchburg, Virginia, for the first six or seven years of his life. And that means the first school that he attended was a segregated school and would remain so for, until the middle of the 1950s and, and beyond. So, you know, there, there, it was a moment where my parents were in a position where they could rise, but where not everybody had the same set of rights afforded to them, such that by the time I went to university, I really was in the lap of luxury. You know, I mean, I, I was in this incredible university setting. I felt comfortable there because my parents had gone to good universities. And I, you know, realized actually in my first week of the university that I felt more at ease than just about any of my classmates, including people who had gone to fancy boarding schools. I had gone to a Jewish day school and didn't come to college thinking that that would put me in the middle of things, but it kind of did. And so that was a sort of surprise to me. So yeah, a lot of people had to work super hard. But if you go back more than four generations, no, I don't think those, you know, relatively poor and unimportant Eastern European Jews had any particular privilege. I don't think they had much privilege at all, but they were lucky enough to be able to come to the United States. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm, you know, deeply, completely, maybe my kids would say too patriotic. Um, I you know, profoundly love my country because without it, these members of my family would have been in the situation that others were in at the time either able to get out to go to what was then Palestine or maybe Canada or Latin America or South Africa. But if they hadn't been able to get out, they would have, many of them would have died, um, you know, in the, in the Nazi Holocaust. So yeah, very, very, very um, risk taking behavior by them to come to the United States. Lot to draw from rich tapestry of your history there, but I do want to pull it all the way back to James Madison. How do you reconcile? So some of the things in the spawning of America are really beautiful. The call for a revolution and the change and the democracy. And I'm curious what stands out for you? How do you reconcile the atrocious, in hindsight, atrocious things that he was involved in and the country that he helped found it? Like, yeah, human beings are incredibly complicated and capable of having high aspirations and ideals for things like equality and independence, even as they fail to recognize that they're denying equality and independence to people around them. And that included not only enslaved black people, but also women. And, you know, it was true of all of those who made the 1776 revolution, essentially. I mean, there may have been a handful of people who were more advanced on the question of slavery than others. There were some, but um, almost nobody in the United States was particularly advanced with the question of the equality of women. Um, that would take, you know, more than a century before the United States reached substantial legal reform, um, and substantially more than a century before women had the right to vote. So I think that's just a phenomenon of people. You know, we're all able to say, wait, treat me equally. I'm just as good as you are. And then forget that there are other people whom we should also be treating equally simultaneously. And I'm not saying that in to forgive us, I'm observing that our self-interest often does a lot to determine what we think of as fair. And so when, when I say X is fair or Y is fair, it's really a healthy thing to do to ask yourself fair to who, you know, is it just that it's fair to me or is it fair to other people who would have the view that I am getting something that they are not in a position to get. And I think that's a useful kind of self check. And at the same time, I think you have to value, nevertheless, the efforts of people who argued for equality and fairness, even when it was incomplete, because those were steps along the way, um, one hopes, to a broader conception of fairness and a broader conception of equality. If you could amend one thing about our U.S. Constitution, what would it be? Today? Something's changed today? Yeah. That's a hard question, but I think probably if it were, you know... By amendment, you mean I was just doing it by my own fiat, you know, that I, I was the, the somehow as the sovereign people of the United States. I think I would amend the Constitution so we had more clarity around the question of racial equality. You know, the, the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection, but that leaves room for a debate, which is alive right now, which the Supreme Court will be working on this year, of under what circumstances it's permissible to use affirmative action or some other remedial mechanism to try to do something about our past in which we did not respect human equality. And because of the way the Constitution is written, it's possible for some to argue that the Constitution doesn't allow that kind of past remediation. 
where it doesn't allow the use of higher values like diversity to try to uh, be used to ensure a differential set of outcomes, a more fair set of outcomes. And that's a problem for our constitutional system that we don't have a clear resolution of this. We have two different positions, each of which is understandable in light of the materials in the constitution. I mean, I have a view for myself about which is right, but I understand that the ambiguity is real. And so the constitutional debate is a real constitutional debate. So I think, you know, if I could amend the constitution, I would say, let's amend it so that we know what the answer to that question is. Um, and so that it's a, an answer that is viable, one that we can morally live with. And in my view, you know, if we had hundreds and hundreds of years of, years of slavery followed by a century plus of segregation, and if the outcome of that is radical difference in human capital, radical difference in economic capital, radical difference in employment and educational opportunities for people based on race, we should have a constitutional arrangement that allows us to fix that. Um, I think that would be just logically as a moral matter, something that I think most people would in principle want to agree with. Mm. So two points on that. One, wouldn't, would this be a situation like Roe v. Wade where perhaps they should have legislated the right and the Supreme Court was just kind of making up the right all along and no one had challenged it? And we don't want people legislating from the bench. So maybe a new law, I guess that's what you're saying. You would amend the constitution. So you'd create some sort of remedial clause. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and to be clear, there is such a clause, you know, I mean, 14th amendment does have a clause section five that allows Congress to pass appropriate legislation that's necessary and appropriate to apply the 14th amendment. The problem is that we're debating what the 14th amendment means. So it's a bit different than the abortion case. In that case, had the United States legislated abortion rights, then there would have been no need for the Supreme Court to decide Roe, then no need for the backlash against Roe, and no need for a circumstance where once Roe has been rolled back, um, you know, s lots of states that might not otherwise have adopted strongly restrictive laws, you know, are doing so. We would just been a completely different scenario um, because there's no reason in principle that abortion had to be a constitutional issue. It could have been resolved legislatively. And in most other countries in the world where it was resolved legislatively, we didn't see the kind of backlash that we've seen in the United States. In the case of the 14th Amendment, though, that's a constitutional value. So if the true meaning of the 14th Amendment were that under no circumstances may a, the government take account of race at all, if that were the meaning, then affirmative action really would be unconstitutional. I don't think that's the most natural or best reading of the 14th Amendment, but the Supreme Court may well adopt a reading like that in the next, you know, in the next year. And so if that's the case, then you wouldn't be able to pass any laws that differed from that because the constitution would govern. So that's why I was suggesting that that's a space where it would be useful to amend the constitution to make it clearer. My second point on that is my property professor at UCLA Law wrote a book called Mismatch, where he detailed an analysis based on stats that he had to actually sue the California bar for to prove that when we use affirmative action, we end up putting students in mismatched universities and it ends up hurting the people that we're trying to help. Is that a theory that you've contemplated while the Supreme Court is going to be contemplating this? I mean, I read the articles that, that led to that book um, and there's a substantial academic literature on both sides, also disputing his, his conclusion. Um, my observed experiences don't fit with the general mismatch claim. Um, I observe that as a general matter, uh, you know, students of color in the universities where I've taught are just as successful as other students who are admitted. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical, I'm a little skeptical as applied. I mean, I'm being polite. I'm very skeptical of that thesis to the extent I've been able to observe it. And on the statistical side, you know, I defer to people who are experts in analyzing the statistics, but there, there are scholars who've disagreed also with that point of view. Certainly. And I think it goes back to what you were saying that just opening more doors is what can lead to a fully blossomed career later on, like how you were enveloped in just that echelon. So the more doors that we can open, I feel like that helps. I think it makes an enormous difference. I mean, I think, you know, different people come differently, quote unquote, prepared for different institutional environments. But then once they're there, they have the opportunity to develop that capacity. And so, you know, I mean, maybe I was a great match when I came to college because I'd been so well prepared for it by a great school and parents who knew exactly what was going on and had their own academic, academic knowledge and expertise. 
But it doesn't follow from that that someone who was from a farm in Idaho and didn't have those privileges shouldn't have been my classmate. You know, that person should, should have been my classmate, even if they were not, quote unquote, as well prepared, precisely because they would have the opportunities that they, that and they did get the opportunities in that in that example that that I had more easily. Are you hopeful for the future of the United States of America? I'm so loyal to and in some ways, even in love with my country, that I would never say that I don't have hope for our future. That said, there are aspects of where we are at this moment in history that scare me. Um, I tend to be a little more optimistic than some of my uh, colleagues and friends are, but I recognize that, um, you know, from 2016 to 2020, we put ourselves through a constitutional stress test. You know, we put ourselves, we, we, you know, we strapped on the electrodes, we got up on that treadmill and we ran as hard as we could till it was really, really hard to breathe. Now, we ultimately did not have a heart attack, and that is a good sign. <laughs> you know, we survived the stress test. That said, we got much closer to the heart attack of constitutional crisis than anyone would want to in a stress test. Can you pull that apart, just the stress test and your role in it? By the stress test, I mean that the then president, you know, self-consciously sought to challenge many, many different norms of how our constitutional system had operated, and he did so in a way that ultimately led to his being impeached twice by the House of Representatives, and that's not a small matter. You know, until then, you know, only Bill Clinton and uh, Andrew Johnson had ever been impeached at all, <laughs> and he was impeached twice. Both times the Senate declined to convict him, so the political system, quote unquote, worked in that sense. Um, I was involved in the first impeachment as a witness testifying uh, in front of the, you know, the House committee that was ruling on the impeachment question. And my job was to try to explain under the Constitution what high crimes and misdemeanors are and what the abuse of office looks like. And I did my best to try to explain that clearly in front of, you know, all the people who are watching on television. Super tense. Those first few minutes, I was like, oh, my Lord, that was they weren't letting you get an a word in, and I was feeling the tension. It was very, very strange and tense experience. You're right. I had almost forgotten those first few moments. You know, we sat down and I thought to myself, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'll say my piece. But instead, there was this drama as, you know, kind of jockeying among the different committee members meant they kept on blocking us from actually saying anything. And so by the time I started speaking, I could feel my heart beating hard in my chest and I thought to myself, I can't believe it. Here's my opportunity and I'm going to sound really nervous. So I just tried to speak as loudly as I could. And I was pleased afterwards to discover that I didn't actually sound as nervous as I actually felt. Um, after a few minutes, I sort of settled into it. But I actually don't think in listening to it that I sounded anything like as nervous as I in fact was. It was a very weird and unusual circumstance. And on top of the jockeying, you're sitting there and then you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm about to recommend on television you know, in front of everybody that the president of the United States, the person we used to call the leader of the free world, should be impeached and removed from office. I mean, that's a moment to really believe that you live in a free country and to believe in the First Amendment and in free speech, because if you didn't live in a free country or if you didn't have free speech, those are not words that you would wisely say in front of, you know, millions and millions of people. But again, that goes to my own sense of patriotism and love of my country. We do live in a country that's fundamentally free, and we do live in a country which has freedom of speech. And that's why it was possible for me to say those things and never seriously worry that I would suffer the consequences that you would in many, many countries in the world if you dared to say something like that. You know, you can't stand up and say something like that in Vladimir Putin's Russia or in Xi Jinping's China. So that's something we should be extraordinarily grateful for. And it's something we have to fight to preserve. You know, freedom like that, true freedom like that, is not a product of just going along every day the way we went along yesterday. It's active hard work by millions of people working together. And to me, that was what I mean by the stress test. And, you know, January 6th, the more that we know about it, the more we understand that although, you know, perhaps the fundamental institutions of our country were not under threat, from the, the people who were invading the Capitol, there were people in the background 
who were hoping precisely to overturn the democratic results of a free election. And those people may have included the president. And that's pretty scary. And that's what I mean by the stress test getting a little too close for comfort to a constitutional crisis and a heart attack, you know, on the on the treadmill is a constitutional crisis for the country. You've written extensively about orthodox Jewry. And I'm curious, do you feel like you're ostracized by that community? Do you submit to the decorum of wearing a kippah? What kind of kippah do you wear? Well, a bunch of questions there. So I was raised monoorthodox and I went to a monoorthodox Jewish day school from first grade through 12th grade. And I continue to consider myself, you know, a full member of the monoorthodox community until I was uh, just about 25. Um, so the first half of my life, more or less up to where I am now. And, um, so my most influential teachers, my most crucial educational experiences, almost all of those came through that milieu. And um, for that reason, I love, I love the Judaism with which I was raised very, very deeply. I love the Torah values. I loved the commitment to trying to live in the modern world and reconcile principles of modernity and liberalism with uh, you know, with the divine law and with the halachic tradition. And I have deep honor and respect for people who continue to make that their primary life goal in the way that they, they see things. Since then, I would say that I have been simultaneously and sometimes sequentially in sympathy with lots of other parts of Judaism as well, ranging from, um, the yeshivish or uh, what sometimes people would call ultra-orthodox, though people don't like to use that term about themselves, um, values uh, that lots of my students at Harvard Law School, interestingly, uh, have espoused over the years. Um, I have, we have a significant number of yeshivish students who come and study at Harvard Law School, sometimes even if they haven't done an undergraduate degree previously, they've only studied in yeshiva, um, all the way to the most progressive um, reform and reconstructionist Jews who see Judaism largely in civilizational terms and who want Judaism to update itself uh, in light of progressive and liberal values. And even to what I sometimes call godless Jews, you know, Jews who believe that their Judaism is connected to their culture, to who the Jews are as a people, perhaps to national feeling in connection with Israel in some cases, but for whom um, their Judaism doesn't depend on any belief in the divine and in some cases not even on any spiritual experience at all. And so I, I value all of those different points of view and all of those different perspectives. And I think at different times I felt pretty much all of those ways of, of engaging. Um, I, when I, until I was 25, I, um, well, until I was 22, I wore yarmulke outside the house wherever I went. Then I went to study in the UK and stopped doing that. Um, now, now I don't wear a yarmulke outside the house. Um, when I do wear a yarmulke, it depends a little bit on what synagogue I'm going to and what the circumstances are, but it tends now to be, um, it tends usually not to be the knit yarmulke, which is the yarmulke of my first 22 years of my life. But I vary between wearing a black velvet yarmulke, which is a bit yeshivish. Uh, I have a very nice brown corduroy yarmulke, which doesn't exactly fit me into any particular group. It's not so easy to identify. But really, I'll wear I'll wear any yarmulke that's appropriate to the place and the and the circumstances. Um, uh, I have the I guess the be the benefit and the burden of knowing the social meaning of every different yarmulke. And you know, we happen to live in a world where what your yarmulke looks like, its size, its shape, its material, its fabric, all of those carry social meaning. Um, so there's no once you know that you can't unknow it for better or worse. How would you address Kanye West and the rise in pop culture of anti-Semitic rhetoric? The fact that a very, very, very famous, albeit, I think it's probably fair to say, not terribly stable, um, you know, celebrity would say the things that, that Ye said is, it's sad. You know, it's, you know, it's, I would say it's bordering on being a tragedy that we live in a world where those kinds of views can be articulated. That said, there was reaction, you know, there was substantial public reaction, there were substantial personal and professional consequences for him. And there's been, I would say, overwhelming rejection of the point of view that he took from all the relevant actors. So I think we can take some solace in that, notwithstanding that it's a shame that he said those things. 
look, I'm not his psychiatrist. And the last thing I'd want to do, I'm not a psychiatrist at all, much less his psychiatrist. And the last thing I'd want to do was to diagnose him remotely. But it didn't seem like, you know, based on his public conduct, it doesn't seem like he's a person who's fully and totally making thoughtful, rational decisions in the full control of all of his faculties. And so I also think it's important to keep that in the backs of our minds when we think about an event like that. And to the extent it's possible to be uh, condemning of what he said in the strongest possible terms, but sympathetic to the idea that what is driving him to say that may be something we don't know anything about. Um, and maybe it would be healthy to, to try to think of it from that perspective. I mean, the fact is there are anti-Semitic perspectives that have never gone away and that are still out there. And there are people out there in our society who believe them. And sometimes some of those people express them publicly. And that's a reality that we have to confront and, and think seriously about. But again, fortunately, the Jewish community has a rich ecosystem of civil society institutions and organizations that spend a lot of time focusing on anti-Semitism and how best to combat it. And so we've got that. And, you know, for the most part, I think we're probably better off having that than we would be not having that. I would counter or push you further with the fact that Dave Chappelle, who is very measured in his public persona and how he conducts himself, he echoed similar sentiments in his stand-up for SNL, his monologue, when he hosted recently. Basically saying, hey, Kanye, yeah, maybe that's true, but you're not supposed to say it out loud. That was sort of his I mean, 15 uh, look, I, I, you know, I watched, I didn't see the, the SNL thing uh, live. I watched clips of it later. So I haven't seen the whole thing in its original context. Dave Chappelle, two things. First of all, he is a comedian. And so it is his job to engage in social commentary that also involves humor. So we should keep that in mind. Second of all, I mean, you know, Dave Chappelle himself is no stranger to controversy. He's been engaged in an extended multi-year social controversy with uh, trans folks. And, you know, that that's way beyond the scope of uh, what I would feel um, expert in weighing in on. But I've certainly observed it, you know, closely on, on all sides. And so, you know, it's not like Dave Chappelle is um, someone who doesn't take risks relative to what is, you know, in the political space. I mean... For sure, he's got lots of people who agree with him out there, um, but there's also lots of people who really deeply disagree with the perspective that he's taken. Um, so it doesn't surprise me so much that, you know, Dave, Dave Spell certainly has no worries about taking a risk. But I don't know, you know, I mean, he, the one thing you will say, you have to say about him is at least in that context, he was being a comedian uh, and, a, and engaged in social commentary simultaneously. And I think, you know, if you push it back a level, do we want to live in a society where we have comedians who take risks in the context of social commentary? In general, yes, we want that. Even if in the given moment, we don't like what a particular comedian has said because it offends whatever our particular identities and values might be, whether those are trans or Jewish or black or what, you know, whatever it happens to be under the specific circumstances. I guess last point on this would be, is there any brushstroke of nuance that you could paint to put some light on what he's saying so that the smidgen of truth isn't what resonates and it forces someone to maybe think a little bit deeper into what that trope that they're pushing is. By that, do you mean the kind of, how does one respond to the, you know, the trope that the Jews control X or the Jews control Y? Sure. I mean, I guess the, the nuance that I would want to offer, um, is that one of the things about anti-Semitism is it's the most protean shape-shifting of biases. And it turns out that it's possible to condemn the Jews as X and simultaneously as not X. So historically, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, Jews were condemned as world capitalists who controlled the money in the world. And simultaneously, they were condemned as communists and Bolshevists, Bolsheviks, whose objective was to destroy all the value in the world and, you know, redistribute everyone's wealth. And, you know, strictly speaking, those are in direct contradiction to each other. Um, that's just one, you know, classic example of an anti-Semitic trope that can be flipped on its head. And then maybe it's the same people, maybe different people can say opposite things and believe it. And, you know, I mean, that tells you something about the nature of anti-Semitism. People who want to have anti-Semitic views will find a way to make up whatever they are. You know, Jews are all powerful. Jews are totally powerless and are trying to, you know, take over and exercise power. And 
you know, these are possible, these things are possible to be said because they're not responsible to any reality. There's no kind of statistical measure that needs to come with it. And the terms of what power is are never being fully defined. And so in that sense, you know, that's not a reason not to take anti-Semitism seriously, but it's a reason to study anti-Semitism in its particular nature and to figure out why it says the things that it says when it says them and to take that seriously in the hopes of avoiding serious negative social consequences arising from people expressing their, their views. Because there's the bad part of people having racist, sexist, homophobic, anti-Semitic views. That's bad in itself. And then there's the social consequences of people acting on those views. And those both need to be addressed and combated. Mm -hmm. You mentioned bias and you spent six years writing that book on Madison, constantly living and breathing this guy's blinders. Did that make you so much more cognizant of like, oh my God, in my own life, I might think I'm striving for my own ideal and I could be missing something in the other room. Like what tool did you want to develop for yourself to address that? I think it did. I think I would actually say, I'm glad you asked that question, Jason. I think it actually did have a transformative effect. Writing that book had a transformative effect on how I think about my own position in the world and on what I'm not paying attention to. I mean, before that, before I wrote the book, I guess in theory, I was open to the idea that, you know, maybe there were contradictions in my own life that I wasn't really fully taking on board. And maybe I was benefiting from the labor of others in various ways or failing to acknowledge my, my power or my privilege, but living, as you said, you said it very beautifully living for six years with Madison's complexity and seeing how little he ever noticed any of it, because it was just the normal feature of his life to a certain degree. And even when people push back the other way, yeah, it made me think I could be just as bad at any given moment. And I have to ask myself about that really carefully. And even in the moments where I think I'm being the most thoughtful and progressive, maybe I'm not. I mean, the most shocking moment for me in, in Madison's life in this regard is when he was a relatively young person, he was in Congress and he'd been living in Philadelphia where the Congress then was. This is before the constitution actually. And he'd had with him uh, a slave who was his personal slave who belonged to him. He'd been given the slave as a gift by his grandmother, if you can believe it. Um, just gives you some sense of the kind of world people, people lived in. Um, and he was about to come home to Virginia and he realized he couldn't bring this enslaved person whose name was Billy back to Virginia because Billy had now lived in Philadelphia where he was technically a slave, but he was living among lots of free blacks. And so Madison was worried that Billy would give the other slaves on the plantation, the idea that they could be free and he'd encourage them to, to run away. So he wrote to his father saying, listen, I can't bring Billy home for this reason. But he said, I also don't want to sell Billy into uh, slavery in the Caribbean simply for wanting the liberty that is the right of all humans and that we fought the revolutionary war for. So here's one slaveholder telling his, another slaveholder, his father, that he doesn't want to sell Billy to the Caribbean just for wanting to be free because there's a human right to be free. And we ourselves had that feeling when we fought in the revolution, which is pretty shocking. And then to make it even more shocking, just to blow your mind even a little bit more, the conclusion he reached was Madison was short on money. The country was in uh, a credit crunch. There wasn't much cash going around. He was dependent on his father for money. His father didn't really want to send him any more money. And so Madison also couldn't justify freeing Billy because Billy was a valuable asset. So he came up with a compromise, which he told his father, which is he sold Billy into endangered, uh, sorry, let me rephrase. He sold Billy into indentured servitude so that Billy would have six years of still being effectively a slave. But at the end of the six years, he would go free. So he got some money for Billy that way. And that was the conclusion that he reached. You know, we, you know, I can't bring him home because then he'll pollute the other slaves. I don't want to sell him to the Caribbean because that seems like a terrible thing to do, but I need to get some money out of him. So I'll just sell his labor for the next six years. And, you know, I think Madison thought he was being, you know, pretty reasonable and moderate in doing that. And it probably patted himself on the back and thought he was a pretty good person. And also hoped his dad wouldn't be mad at him for wasting a valuable resource. And so, you know, to see that, and it's just a few years before he drafted the constitution of the United States and then drafted the bill of rights. So, you know, that brought home to me 
that I'm definitely no better than Madison. You know, I'm not smarter than Madison. I'm not wiser than Madison. I'm not more knowledgeable than Madison. And all I can try to do is look outside myself and see that there are contradictions and conflicts in the way that I live too. And yeah, I think that had a big, big impact on me. And it made me a lot more skeptical of the kinds of ways that I am fortunate to, to have the kinds of privilege that I do indeed have. My shock jock in me wants to say that I saw a clip recently of this British parliamentary leader that was being pressed on slavery and reparations. And she said, well, you have to go all the way up the supply chain. And so reparations should come from where the slaves came from. And it resonated on some level because I've definitely heard that rhetoric before, but it's impossible not to think about just how dark our beginning of our country is. And you painting that picture really hammers that home. Yeah. And look, you met many different people along a complex supply chain benefited from the enslavement of human beings. And that's why, for example, universities in the Northeastern United States, where there was no, not well, there wasn't, there was some slavery, but there wasn't massive scale slavery. Uh, have nevertheless had to engage in these serious reconsiderations of their own histories. Um, you know, Harvard University, my colleague Tomiko Brown Nagin, uh, who's a professor at the law school and the dean of the Radcliffe Institute, just was the lead author of a lengthy, really just a volume, analyzing slavery and its relationship to Harvard and Harvard's wealth. And it's very thoughtful and it's very balanced, um, but it also is very honest in acknowledging the ways that slavery is part of the national economy and, in, 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 you know, as a consequence, it affected everybody in the country, including institutions like those. So yeah, that's part of our reality. But does that mean we shut up shop and, you know, don't do our jobs? No, of course it doesn't. We just need to be grownups and grownups acknowledge that things aren't perfect and that people are imperfect. And then we try to cobble together some way of going forward. That's as fair as we can make it out to be. Hmm. Final question. What are your thoughts on the LGBTQT battle that Yeshiva University is fighting? It's been a long saga. The Supreme Court has touched it. What are, what are your thoughts on that? controversy. Well, it's not over, as you say. I mean, I think we'll, it'll go back to the Supreme Court. One thing that uh, has influenced my thinking about it is the practical fact, which has not been widely reported, that the reason that Yeshiva University found itself in this situation is that back in the 1970s, it registered with the state of New York as a secular institution. And then that subjected it to the state's civil rights rules um, which include a no discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation principle. And it's interesting that, um, and this has been noted in the, actually in the, in the Haredi world, that at the time that why you made that decision, um, uh, the Rav, uh, Rav Yosef Ber Soloveitchik, who was the spiritual leader of, of yeshiva at the time, strongly, strongly objected, publicly objected to the board of directors agreeing to make yeshiva technically a secular institution, because as he pointed out correctly, yeshiva university is not a secular institution and shouldn't be a secular institution. Um, and I think the Rav was correct. I think that was a mistake for, for YU and it's issued in, you know, many, many years later in this case. Now, once that's happened, the litigation will, has taken the form of the university saying that even if it were registered as a religious institution, it shouldn't be obligated to have a gay student club. And that's its own complicated question. But in general, you know, the legal arrangements that govern religious liberty are much more permissive for religious institutions than they are for secular institutions. And that makes sense because it makes sense to have at least some degree of accommodation of religious beliefs, right? Unemployment law or rather employment discrimination law should not make it a crime for the Catholic Church only to have male priests, right? That shouldn't be a discrimination violation. And indeed, you know, the anti-discrimination laws are understood to entail an exemption for ministerial positions. And so it might well be that under the best reading of New York's law, if yeshiva is a religious institution, it would get an exemption and wouldn't have to have the, the club. So that's, you know, it's an unfortunate aspect of the way it's emerged. And I also think that it's unfortunate from the standpoint of YU that it finds itself in this high profile litigation without being able to begin by saying, well, we're a religious institution and we're being required to do something that violates our own perception of our, of our religious beliefs. Um, 
You know, I also think that, you know, an issue for an organization like YU to ask itself is, you know, there already was a gay students club on campus at YU and modern orthodoxy increase, increasingly is willing to acknowledge that some people are gay. And then that raises the very complex halakhic questions, Jewish law questions of, you know, what those people should do in their daily lives and how they ought to live their lives. But in principle, it doesn't seem to me that acknowledging that people are gay and that they want to get together to talk about their experiences is violative of the basic principles of the halacha. Of course, in principle, in principle, one should defer to the leadership of a religious institution in deciding what its religious beliefs are. And I, you know, I would, I would share that and I would defer to, the, to YU's leadership on that front. But I would ask the question, you know, whether there, there is a way for them to have an organization like this without feeling that it somehow violated their core, core principles. But that's not going to resolve the case. It's going to get resolved now through litigation and it's going to go back to the Supreme Court. While talking about being gay in a room could lead to other things, which would violate the Leviticus uh, prohibition that they are so uh, worried about, I was thinking when the whole saga broke out that if they take even one dollar of government money, then wouldn't they have obligations to, especially now that I know that they're filed as a secular institution, but if they take even one dollar of government money, wouldn't they have an obligation to keep church and state separate and thereby in their policy, keep it separate and there? by creating an obligation for them to have space for kids of LGBTQT. Well, federal law is a little more nuanced than that. I mean, federal law does allow um, private institutions to receive state aid without it following that they have to become wholly secular. Georgetown University is a you know, Catholic Jesuit university, but it receives federal aid nevertheless. So no, under currently existing law, it's it's not the case that the governmental aid entails requiring the institution to be wholly secular. Um, it's more nuanced than that. And then it would be different under federal law than it would be under state law. And the law in question here is the New York, the New York state law um, that, uh, that governs YU. Very interesting. And I, um, yeah, I can't wait to see how that unfolds and interesting to hear your perspective on, you'd want to hear from their leadership. What is actually wrong? In yeah, the face and I mean, of your values. Have, have, to be fair, they have tried to articulate their own view. They, they think that having the club entails a kind of endorsement of, I guess, an endorsement of gay practice. Um, I'm not sure it really does entail that, but I, you know, I'm willing to be deferential to the people who run an institution and their understanding of the, the meaning of, of what the club would be. Um, but, you know, look, I mean, one of the things that's, that, that's been happening in modern orthodoxy that is desirable in my perspective, from my perspective, is increased, gradually increasing openness and tolerance to the challenges faced by gay people who are also committed, observant, orthodox Jews and are struggling with what that would mean for their lives. And I think that within modern orthodoxy, more than among in Haredi Judaism, there increasingly is room for, at a minimum, a sympathetic and empathetic perspective. And it would be nice to see the flagship institution of modern orthodoxy, which Yeshiva University still is, um, exploring the ways that they could, you know, embody the value of support and love for all Jews, which I know that YU is committed to uh, in this context as well. But it's, you know, it's their institution and it's up to them to do what they want to do with it. Any other big, exciting projects before we close out that I should be on the lookout for from you? Well, it's, it's a still a ways from publication, but um, I am actually working on a, a book right now that uh, is about, broadly speaking, contemporary Jewish life and the perspectives of different Jews from all the way on the Haredi side to all the way on the godless side, um, both in Israel and in the United States and around the world. And um, I'm uh, deep in my second draft of the book and thinking hard about all the questions on the Jewish side that you and I have been talking about. And so that will come out um, probably uh, probably sometime in uh, 2023. That is, the, that is the plan. So cool. God, God willing, willing, as they say. <laughs> well, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you very much for your time. I learned a lot, and I, uh, I look forward to speaking to you again sometime. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show.